lot to remember <laughs> sometimes. And you know, we've we've got the podcast. You can go back and listen to it, or it's on YouTube. Um, and and kind of get it in your mind. But what I want to do tonight is give us a way of looking at it that's practical and that keeps this in, in front of us. All right. So uh, we've done this over and over again, but I, I want to do it one more time. So a recap. We started with partnership. Partnership is living my life on God's agenda in His presence with His resources. It's living my life on God's agenda in His presence with His resources. That's what we were made for. That's what you see with Adam and Eve in the garden. That's what they lost with the fall. That's why God said to them things like, by the sweat of your brow will you bring forth fruit. We didn't get a job with the fall. That is not that now we have to work because of the fall. We had work before that. Work was work is a beautiful thing. Um, work is the creation of good. What we were meant to do is create that good in partnership with God. So, um, you know, if Adam wanted to move a tree or if a tree was in the wrong spot or if it wasn't producing the way it was supposed to, he could just speak to it and it would respond. Um, and we see that with Jesus, don't we? Jesus comes across the fig tree and it's, you know, it's got leaves, but it doesn't have figs. It wasn't the season for figs. But uh, the way I understand it, um, that that type of tree, if it had leaves, it should have had figs. So, I mean, something was wrong. Either it had leaves out of season or the figs didn't come. So you and I, if we were going to get rid of a tree, we would be sweating by the time we got through because we'd have to chop it down and dig it up and all that good stuff, right? Um, Jesus just spoke to it. And so that's partnership. Um, and Jesus said that. He said, I don't do anything on my own, but I speak and my Father works. And you know, he was saying to the disciples there in John 14, which is the big partnership passage, um, a lot of times people look at that John 14 as a like heaven when you die passage because he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But what we recognize in that passage is it's actually Jesus showing how he has been with the Father and everything that he did and how he's transferring that over to us as his disciples. You know, he kind of brings them in and he says, I don't do anything on my own. Uh, I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. Believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me or at least believe because of the works. What he means by belief because of the works is, you know, when you see the, what he's saying is when you see the things I've done, you know I didn't do them on my own. Um, you know, when, a human voice can't bring people back from the dead that have been dead for four days. Right? Oh, okay. Makes sense. <laughs> that That's what it sounds like. It sounded like a stomach. I knew it was mine. It's like it's something behind me. I was kind of afraid to look around. Okay, so where were we? All right, so a human voice don't bring people back from the grave. Only a human voice in spoken with God brings people back from the grave. Human hands can't break bread and fish and a few bread and fish and feed 20,000 people. That has to be done in connection with God. And what we see in Jesus as the second Adam was everything that we were meant to be. And so when we step into partnership with Him, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, He said. The yoke is when you put two animals together to do work with each other, right? And notice He didn't say take, let me take your yoke on me. He didn't say that. You know, we, we talk about that. We, we say sometimes, ask Jesus into your life. But that's actually backwards. Jesus asked us into His life. And there's a big difference. When I ask Jesus into my life, He's kind of my servant, and I look at the things that I want or need, and I, I, th I think He should bow to that. right? But when I'm asking into His life, then I recognize that everything I do is actually for His glory. It doesn't mean to seek first the kingdom of heaven, for instance. It doesn't mean that I change what I'm doing, but it means I change the purpose behind the things that I'm doing. So the big thing behind partnership is two things. Is One, our, we are on His agenda. Everything that I do can be done on Jesus' agenda. Everything. <clears throat> Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Colossians 3.17 says. So that covers everything. So if I'm doing something that I go, eh, I don't know if I can do this on Jesus' agenda, that's probably the stuff I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but anything that, you know, any good human endeavor can be a part, I can make that a part of Jesus' agenda. All right? Uh, 
and so the second thing is is that when I do it on his agenda I'm assured of his presence and resources he steps with me when I do things in his name and he moves with me. So that's where the transference goes. He says, I speak and my Father works. I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. At least believe because of the works. And then he goes a step further and he says, now anything you ask in my name, it'll be done for you. And you will do greater works than me. Now remember he said, in my name. That does not mean to say in the name of Jesus when you do it. It's, that's it's good, but that, it's not going to cover it. To do it in his name means you're doing it on his agenda. You're doing it for his sake. And right now, there's a lot in us that even when we think we're doing things for His agenda, our own agenda is wrapped up in there. So God doesn't just dump that blank check on us to start out with, right? But Dallas Willard says that it is God's intent for each of us that He would empower us to do anything that we want to do. That it's God's intent for each of us that He would empower us to do anything that we want to do problem is, and that's what that scripture means, whatever you ask. The problem is there has to be a lot of work on what we want, on our wanter, in order for that to be safe, in order for that to be in his name. Because I can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. right. And so, But I've seen a lot of not so good things blessed by God because it was done for the right reasons. So <coughs> partnership is living on God's agenda in His presence with His resources. Now, that is the absolutely crucial part of that is servanthood. Because what God's agenda is at any given moment, in any given moment, in any situation, He wants to bless everybody that's involved. So, you, when you walk into work and you, you think to yourself or you say to yourself, what is God's agenda here? The overarching agenda is He wants to bless people. Now, that also means he wants the job done well because that blesses people. And he might have some insight for you about how to do the job or what, whatever situation it is. We see that with Jesus. Sometimes it just seems like he's just doing, he's just blessing because he's there. So I ask him for something, he does it. And sometimes he seems to be given some insight on what needs to be said or done in the situation, right? So sometimes God might say to you, this is what I want done. But in most cases, you may not hear that. <clears throat> So you, as a free partner with God, you get to decide what's done. But you do so as a servant. The only way you're going to be able to live in His name is to have His heart. And His heart is the heart of a servant. His heart is actually a heart of humility. Not a humility that says, oh, I'm no good. But the humility that says, you're worth dying for. That you're worth my life. That's what He did for each of us. He thought all of us were worth his life. So in that context, Paul has this phrase. He says, in humility, consider others more significant than yourself. That's how we partner with God. I can't partner with God just by doing, trying to do great things. I partner with God when I try to do great things in his power for the good of others, considering them more significant than myself. That's the key to surviving burnout with service. Because often we... Anybody ever experienced burnout sure. by serving? Well, often we're, we can't say no. And so <clears throat> kind of an underlying agenda is pleasing people, right? So that kind of gets mixed in there with the good that we want to do. Paul says that in Romans 7. When I try to do good, evil's right there with me. Okay? So that's where things like trust comes in. See, I can't live fully as a servant for the good of others, considering others more significant than myself on God's agenda, when I've still got all of these underlying agendas in me that are trying to make life work. So what we said when we taught on trust was that in life apart from God, we're all born dead in trespasses and sins. So because we're born in dead, dead in trespasses and sins, we don't have the vital aliveness that comes in life connected with God. So what we substitute for that is the fulfillment of our desires. Desires for control and power. Desires for notoriety, for applause. I heard about a preacher the other day who said he goes on vacation and then he has to hurry back from vacation because he suffers from praise withdrawal. <laughs> so he has to come back so people can... And he admitted this. He has to come back so people can tell him how good he is in the end. And so we struggle with those kinds of things, right? People pleasers are not just 
servant-minded people, they also want people to like them. And that's why they live for, for people pleasing. And that is a, that's an addiction that we get. That's one of the things. It feels really good when people say good things about us. And that's not bad. The fulfillment of our desires aren't bad. What's bad is when they are what's running the show. When I have to have that desire fulfilled, when that becomes the, the agenda behind what I'm doing, or at least it, you know, it didn't start out that way, but very quickly we find out that it's there and it's very prevalent. It always keeps us from living fully as a servant because it's trying to pull us down. So what trust does, trust is reliance upon the goodness and the sufficiency of God. In life apart from God, we're relying on the goodness and sufficiency of the fulfillment of our desires. Whether it be fleshly <coughs> desires, whether it be these desires about being noticed or liked, or desires for control and power, those are the, kind of the three main categories of desires that end up taking the place of God in our souls. And they're what we rely on. So once we rely on the goodness and sufficiency of God, we find out that if our desires aren't fulfilled, it's not a big deal. You know, it's like you've got the Mississippi River Right, and you've did, been denied a cup of water. Not a big deal when you've got the Mississippi. Of course, you don't might not want to drink out of the Mississippi. So it's probably not an altogether good <laughs> illustration. You but you get the point. Right. So if you've got this vital aliveness that comes in life from God, if you're denied this thing, if if you're living in the light of how awesome God thinks you are, and then somebody criticizes you, not a big deal. When you really, when really, you really know, not just you've read or you've heard somebody say, but you know by experience how amazingly good God is, then you, and, and what He thinks of you, then when you don't get what you want, it's not a big deal. When somebody says something about you, it can roll off of you much easier, right? You're not living in a sense of deprivation. The reason desires get the, the grip on us that they do is because we're living in a sense of deprivation because of life without God. When we rejoin, when we reconnect with God, we have to learn to live connected with Him. But as we do, and as we go further and further into that, then we're able to rely on what we're, the life we receive from Him rather than what we receive from these outside sources. Okay? All right, I can't go too deeply in that. How are we doing on time? Somebody let me know. 7.36. 7.36, good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. See, I can rely on God's goodness and sufficiency. Just let it roll off. Yeah. Just let it roll off your eyes. Okay, so the only way... Now, oh, and by the way, on trust, by, by and large, these disciplines of abstinence deal in this area of trust. Okay? Uh, because those are the things that are taking the place of... There's nothing wrong with anything that we're letting go of on this sheet. Okay? It's not a sin to not do these things. But, if we don't do these things, it will lead to sin because we will not remove the grip that these desires have on our soul. Make sense? So these allow us to experience God in a way that we can learn to trust Him. His goodness and sufficiency rather than the fulfillment of these desires. Most of the disciplines of abstinence deal with some type of desire, whether it be power, notoriety, fleshly, or whatever. Okay, so, uh, and then from trust, we, it's in, the foundation for trust is beholding. Beholding is revisioning our life in the context of God and His kingdom. And, and so one of the illustrations I gave, because all of y'all are old enough, y'all remember the magic eye. <coughs> Sheets where you look at it, you see the the picture within the picture, right? Yeah. Um, yeah my mother in we did that. What's that? I had a college class we did that. That's all we did. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's <impressive. laughs> That's That's Communications. <laughs> wow. That was our spare for communications degrees. So. I have my favorite class. But when you first look at them, and if you've never done it, you're like, there's no picture there. And I passed it around one time with people, and some of them had never seen it. And I was like, there's nothing there. I don't see anything. Yeah, there's a draft, but it's, there's a bunch of drafts. And, but then people that had done it, they're like, oh, yeah, it's Noah's Ark. There's a draft there. It's just there. And other people think they're lying. They're making it up. But the more you get used to it, like I can walk up to them and I can get it like that. It's because I've done it enough, yeah. right? It's the same way with the kingdom. 
uh, the, it's not the exact same way, but it's the same idea. It's like a cast. Because, yeah, it's like a magic cast. It's got to hold your eyes right. But Paul tells us, don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. When you're telling somebody to look at that picture, you're like, don't focus right there. Yeah. You kind of got to look at a, sort of beyond it. I don't even know how to describe right. it, but you just don't look at one thing, yeah. right? What's that? Almost you almost have to cross yeah. your eyes so that you're not focusing yeah. on one thing, yeah. right? So to see it, you can't. And in fact, like if you're fo if you're seeing it and then you see this little thing and you try to take your eyes to it, you lose it, right? Okay. So with the kingdom, if we're tr if we're looking at things which are seen, which are, is the enemy's work with us, he's constantly trying to get us distracted. Like you look over here, you got these finances, this child over here. What did this person say about you over here? Did you see the way she looked at you? Da da da. da. All that stuff is the stuff that's seen, and the enemy will constantly keep you focused. And it's not necessarily bad stuff, good stuff too. And but if that's what we're looking at, then we will miss the presence of the kingdom. So we have to intentionally learn to look at the things that aren't seen. And so a lot of these disciplines of gauge and engagement allow us to do that. So I talked about last week and I asked you questions. Y'all talked about, the, or a couple weeks ago, the doors. Like you're on vacation and you're seeing door hardware on doors. It's kind of sad. But, but it's the same thing as me walking into somebody's house and almost grabbing their they're out going mail that they're in the box. And most of y'all wouldn't have seen that. I wouldn't have seen door it's hardware. Bellamy. What's that? <laughs> 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 Technically, I am a mail carrier. Um, yeah, it's a gray area. Um, or, or, or Jill seeing pots. I, I listened to the video yesterday to make sure I didn't repeat oh, myself too much. <laughs> and you talk about potted plants. Yeah, yeah. So most of us don't see that kind of stuff. Um, but the more we engage with doors, we see them. Yeah. Or with mail, we see it with pots or whatever it is you engage with. So the more you engage with the kingdom, it actually opens you up to the presence of the kingdom. And you can learn to make that your focus. But you have to be really intentional about it. None of this stuff happens uh, just by doing it once. Like, I played the piano... Mm, very mediocre today, at best. If we do this in a year, and I don't practice any more between now and then, how well do you think I'll do it next year? Probably worse. Last year you're going to cram the practice. Maybe I might cram right in last year. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so who do you think would win in a contest between me and Amy on play in song? Amy. I think it's probably Amy, yeah. Well, see, that's because Amy's internalized it. She's practiced it. You know, it, it, what, what's one of the things you used to see in your sleep, Amy? I used to see chords. Chords in her sleep. <laughs> she'd close her eyes and she could see chords. Because she practiced <laughs> and practiced and practiced. And she began to see the world through chords and through music. Do you know what? I'm sorry. I was sure. Sorry, but that was the interesting thing. Because a long time ago when I was taking Spanish, my, I talked in my sleep and my roommate said I was speaking Spanish in my sleep. <laughs> and I was freaking out about that. But then but my Spanish teacher was like, no, that is one of the signs that you're becoming fluent. Yes. Like in any language, like mm -hmm. when you're, so music, your language, mm -hmm. you know, That's it. Fluent. fluent is actually the bueno. perfect way. Yes. <laughs> bueno. Fluent is the perfect word. The perfect word for that. Because when you're fluent in something, you're no longer having to think about it, right? Yeah. When you speak a language fluently, you're if you speak Spanish fluently, you're thinking in Spanish. You're not thinking in English and translating it. That's not considered fluent. Fluent is when you begin thinking. It's, I watch these these Hispanic people blow my mind. It's like their children, and they'll be like their parents will be talking in English and then they start all around them in Spanish yeah. and the kids are just doing both yeah, just as freely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And blows my mind, but they're fluent because it, 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 it's natural for them. So what if these things we became fluent in? Wouldn't it be cool? Like I didn't have to go, okay, no, I'll, it doesn't matter what she said about me. I am a child of the king. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to that was not my intention. <laughs> but we have to do that, right? So, and, and, and these things, they're not natural, they're not native, they're not fluent with us. So what if there was a way to get them fluent? There is. And I'm going to tell you how to do it tonight. But here's the bad news. 
The bad news is, it's oh, not an overnight process. <laughs> <laughs> it is you not. You give us seven minutes to tell us, though. Do I really? Is it yeah, it's uh, 7.43. 43. We got 17 minutes. <laughs> you told me to tell you when it was 10 till. Yeah. That's my 10 minute warning. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> See if I remember what I was saying. Okay, so the, the, the good news is we do have a way of doing this. The bad news is it's not an overnight process. Uh, but it is a it, we can we can we can live in such a way that we know that we're growing in that. Okay? Alright. And so uh, Jesus says. In John 8, 31, he says, If you abide in my words, you're truly my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Have you ever wondered if you were even a disciple of Jesus? Have you ever wondered that? I've wondered that. Um, I've wondered it this past week, and I have to remind myself of that scripture a lot of times. If you abide in my words, you're truly my disciples and know the truth, and you, the truth will set you free. Okay, so what you know is you begin to know this. I don't mean know this like you could teach the class. Unfortunately, I could teach the class all day and not know this. Paul said, I beat my body and making my slave list. After, after preaching to others, I myself would be disqualified. He was given a, a he, there he was given like a, a, a an athletic uh, metaphor. And what he was saying is, it doesn't do me any good to know how to run the race if I don't actually discipline myself to do it, right? I can know everything in, for years and years and years. I read every magazine, Todd, you're going to this, every magazine that came through the mail about working out. I had a thousand workouts in my head. And I would work out once a year. Once I would work out once a year, right? It didn't do me a lot of good. Now lately we've been sticking with it. We've been pretty consistent lately. Um, we'll see how that lasts. Um, but it doesn't matter how much I had in my head, it didn't do me any good if I didn't do it with my body, if I didn't put it into practice. Okay, so it doesn't matter how well I know this, and Paul was saying the same thing, if I'm not putting it into practice, then I can't, it's not going to do me any good. And then on the other hand, it doesn't matter if I can articulate this or not, if I know how to live it, that outweighs it. Okay? It doesn't matter how well I can articulate it, if I'm living it, I'll get it. And I'll be able to understand it better. My uncle often will call me on the way home. He's, he works on uh, machinery. He's like a maintenance manager at a plant or something. And um, so he'll call me and tell me about some machine that broke down. And he'll talk about the wires and then da 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 da. He might as well be speaking Spanish because I don't understand a word he's saying. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. I've not had any experience with it. But if I would go work with him, which I'm not going to, but if I would go work with him and get my hands on it, then he could talk about it and it would make sense to me, right? So it's the same thing with this. You know, people often say, how do I study the Bible? Really, you study the Bible by putting it into practice. And if you put it into practice, you read it, you practice it, you'll get it. It'll start to make sense. Okay, so specifically, Jesus said, if you abide in my words, you're truly my disciples. In that passage in John 14, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. He says this three times, and he brings in all three members of the Trinity when he says it. He says, if you love me, you keep my commands, and I will give you the spirit of truth who will be with you forever. If you love me, you'll keep my commands, and I will manifest myself to you. If you love me, you'll keep my commands, and my Father and I will come and make our home with you. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit promise that we keep His commands. So it's the keeping of His commands that we find out, that we learn how to do these things. We we can put our minds on these things. That's why we do teaching. The teaching is crucial. The teaching is important. But what it allows us to do is to see the areas in our life that are deficient. So for instance, let's say I choose to bless those who curse me. And I, that, we take that command. You choose one command. You say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn how to bless those who curse me. All right. As I step into that, first thing I'm probably going to do is not be able to bless those who curse me. I'm going to find myself in a situation where that doesn't work out. Okay? So what that allows me to do is to go back and look at these areas and say, what is it in me that kept me from blessing those who curse me? Okay? Or for instance, Jesus says in His first command in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, He, he talks about anger. 
It talks about laying aside anger and laying aside contempt. Um, okay, so uh, anybody ever tried to not get angry anymore? Anybody ever said that? I'm not, I'm just not going to get angry anymore. Right? You, what's that? I say it every time after yeah. I got angry. Every time after you get angry. Yeah, yeah. Every day. Yeah. Yep, so I'm just not going to get angry anymore. So how well does trying real hard work? It, it's kind of like if I tried real hard to play the piano well next year and I didn't practice all year, right? Okay, so, so but, but if I will abide in his words, then I'll know the truth. So if I keep practicing laying aside anger, then I'll eventually know the truth and the truth will set me free. But here's the deal. Abiding in this word encaptures, encaptures the, the entire thing. So why, what does it mean? And this is where the teaching comes in. What does it mean? Why did Jesus say live without anger? See, I, I need to know why he said what he said. Why is what he said was bad, bad? And why is what he says good, is good? What, what, what's the reason behind it? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate with anger. Uh, you know, we could go through the whole Sermon on the Mount, but that would take us a little while. But I'm just going to illustrate with anger how this works. So what is wrong with anger? The thing that's wrong with anger is it pulls me out of this. I can't partner with God in anger most of the time because it pulls me out of this idea of servanthood. Servanthood means I'm working for the good of others. But when you're angry, what do you, what do you want to do to the person you're angry at? Yeah. Yeah. You want to hurt them. Anger always brings with it the will to harm. Always. That's why we say things like, well, I never would have said that if I wasn't mad. Anger always brings with it the will to harm. It might not be physically, but we want to harm either by not responding, by shutting off. Some people harm by shutting off. And sometimes that's protection as well. But sometimes it's a way to get, get to people, isn't it? Or you want to jump back, or you want to stick your finger out the window as well, right? Some way you, you 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 want to needle that person in some way. So anger always brings with it the will to harm. All right. Um, so my illustration for this is, and, and I may have told y'all about this, but uh, it's really about the time Stephen was learning to tie shoes, and um, y'all have probably heard it in other classes. Maybe the rest of you haven't. But so Stephen, we were Amy and I were leading praise and worship at my home church, and we had to be there at nine o'clock with like 18 kids, and um, and some of, several of them still in diapers. And so we're trying to get out the door, and Stephen's learning to tie his shoes. He's like, Daddy, can you help me tie his shoes? I said, no, bud, we, I don't have time. Let's, let's go get in the van. And he asked me again, and we were already behind, we were already running around, and so what did I do when he asked the second time? Yelled. Yeah, blew up at him. You know, and it would have been fine for me to say, no, Stephen, I said, I can't do that right now. I need you to get in the van, or there's going to be a punishment. All that would have been fine. But what I did do was not fine. I got incredibly angry and I blew up at him. And I saw the damage that I did when I did so, right? Um, okay, so let's diagnose why did I do that. See, because here's the cool thing about the commands of Jesus. Here's the cool thing about... If there's a good thing about committing sins, this is the good thing about committing sins. Ooh, I the, <laughs> you misunderstand. <laughs> okay, so the individual sins that we commit are symptoms of a deeper cause. So when Jesus said, if you abide my words, you're true my disciples, you know the truth, the truth will set you free. The Pharisees responded, we're Abraham's children, we've always been free. And then Jesus said, oh, well, if you committed a sin, you're a slave to sin. Right? So sin is not an oops. The anger was not, oh, I just blew it. The anger was a symptom that there was some... The anger, the sin, the individual sin that I committed was a symptom of an underlying cause of sin, a condition in my heart that caused me to do that. Anytime you commit individual sins, it is always an indication of an underlying cause that needs to be fixed. And those places need to be, they need to be transformed. Fixed is not the right word. They need to be transformed and there's something, or maybe in every one of these areas, there's something that needs to be transformed. So back to where I blasted Stephen, okay? So what was that about? Well, first off, it took me completely out of servanthood because I'm no longer about doing what's good for him. I'm about controlling him and making him do what I want him to do, right? The moment where I said, no, 
If I would have said no, I, I've already said I can't do that right now. I need you to get in the van, or it's going to be a punishment. That could be a servant, good, right? That's not about me. That's about him learning how to live in in uh, connection with with other people, in respect and in honor and things like that. It's a beautiful thing, but the unleashing wasn't servanthood. So where did that come from? What pulled me out of it? Well, what was I trusting? Was I trusting the goodness and sufficiency of God? Does anything change about God if I'm five minutes late for praise and worship practice? What does change? Your control. How people look at you. How people look at me. Yeah. yeah. See, because here's Amy and me. We were we were the super people, right? We were involved in this and we were involved in that. We have all these kids and we da 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 da. And people <laughs> talked about us and it felt good for people to say things like, "I don't see how you do it all." And it felt so good. And if we start showing up late for things, which we started doing, which we still do, <laughs> then people start saying things like, oh, obviously they don't have it all together. Being late, that's kind of a spiritual problem, I think. <laughs> Man. <laughs> you can, I mean, really, I've heard things like that. And, and so you start to get that stuff in the back of your mind. And then the pressure, I'm trusting the goodness and sufficiency of people's opinions of me rather than the goodness and sufficiency of God. So I need to go back and I need to look at my life again. And I need to see, okay, wait a second. What, what, what does this mean? Where, where am I seeing things wrongly? Have I, do I have too much to do? And if I have too much to do, why do I have too much to do? Is it because God gave me too much to do, or did I do that to myself, or did I let other people do it to me? Right? And what I'll find is I'll look at these disciplines, and I'll start to find remedies in these disciplines for the problems in my soul that are causing me to do the things that I don't want to do. Does that make sense? So Jesus, when He was talking about the anger thing, listen, it's not enough just to not get angry. I know people that are very good at not getting angry and they're still jerks. <laughs> Just call it what it is. Um, and I've seen people manipulate kind of lower, at least lower socially people, manipulate them and get them angry and make them look bad. But really it was the other person, you know? So just not getting angry is not enough. See, the point isn't not being angry. The point is partnership through serving. That's the point. And so Jesus says, when He says all that about not being angry and not, not doing the content thing, He says, so if you're at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother. Okay, so now we're getting to the heart of what's going on. He didn't leave us any wiggle room there. You know, He said if your brother has something against you, I'd be apt to say, man, my problem. He's the one who's got a problem. Well, you don't get out of it with Jesus. If they got a problem with you, then it is your problem. And the reason it is your problem is because we are relational beings and we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves, whoever that is. And if somebody has a problem with me, then I've interacted with them in some way, and they are in some way, some form or fashion, my neighbor. There's levels in this that, you know, there's, there's deeper levels of intimacy and less levels of intimacy. But my neighbor is just the person that I live interactively with in some way. Okay? And if I remember that my brother or my neighbor has something against me, then there's no way I could offer my gift at the altar and not at least try to reconcile. Is my heart more towards the gift at the altar or is it more towards reconciliation? Another illustration he gives right there, he says, so if you're on your way to court, settle with your adversary on the way. What kind of heart settles with their adversary on the way to court? Well, it's the person that says, hey, man, if you need something, let me know what you need. I'll help you. How easy would it be for you to help somebody that you found out was in need that just got through some of your pants off or something? 
It wouldn't be easy, would it? But if you had the heart of a servant, then that would just be natural. Because you're not trusting the goodness and sufficiency of your own finances. You're trusting the goodness and sufficiency of God. So that would enable you to live as a servant. So what we find is whenever we're holding on to resentment, whenever we're dealing with lust, whenever we're dealing with manipulation, whenever we're dealing with anger and contempt or blessing or all of these things, when there's something that we're struggling with, there are areas here that will be highlighted if we'll take time to prayerfully consider it. Maybe go to somebody and talk to them. Uh, but often, just through prayer and meditation, we can think about these things. And we can say, God, what is it? I think Psalm 32 talks about uh, send your light in me. Show me what's in me. And we can do that. We can say, Lord, why do I keep? Why do I keep unleashing? Why do I keep? Why can't I be honest? You know, some people just cannot be honest. Why can't I be honest? And, and see, the thing is, there's no condemnation. There's no guilt. Okay? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who in here is in Christ Jesus? All of us. There's no condemnation. We have to let go of condemnation if we're going to step into these things. Because if we don't, condemnation will be the biggest barrier to living that out. You can't live as God's child if you're dealing with condemnation. So step into these. Choose something. All right? Whether it be uh, anger or whatever. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a good place to start. Look at those things. See something you struggle with. And say, by God, I am going to learn to do that. That's what it means to abide in His words and truly be His disciples. Now, if you're His disciple, what does that make Him? If you're His student, what is He? Teacher. He's your teacher. You can count on Him. You are not on your own. The first place of partnership with God is in learning to do the things that Jesus said. The only way we ever learn to partner with Him in the other areas of our life is as we learn to do the things that He said was good and right. He said was best. And we find out why none of His, none of his prohibitions are to spoil your fun or to make your life miserable. It's actually the best way to live. And when we step in His commands, we're set free because we find out it really is the best way to live. If I never got angry again, I would be very happy with that. It wouldn't hurt my feelings to never be angry again. Right. So, step into His commands. Let it highlight those places in our area without guilt, without condemnation. And then we can take these disciplines and we can look at them. This is your sheet. You're not bound to what's on here either. You know, um, you can find ways to, you know, like living without hurry is not on here. Riding in the slow lane is not on here. But if you find that you can't be nice to people because you're always in a hurry, then maybe you need to go a month and only drive in the slow lane. Every time you get out, only in the slow lane. goes faster. Yeah. And, and you might not even be able to do that, so you might have to start with solitude. And then solitude might enable you. See, these disciplines, listen, the discipline enables me to do what I cannot now do. So I practiced this week, I practiced this week to enable me to play the songs because I couldn't play them last week. And you might would say, well, you couldn't play them this week either. I promise you it was much better than last week. So we practice. We do these disciplines. They enable. So if you can't, if you find something you can't do, you can't quit getting angry. Well, you realize you're in a hurry. Well, I can't quit hurrying. We're driving the slow lane. You know what? I can't even do that. Start. Find the thing that you can do. And that will be the place you partner with God. You say, okay, I can do solitude for 10 minutes. But that's as long as I can stand. Partner with God and it'll grow. And the next thing you know, you're, you're not in a hurry anymore. And you're not yelling at people the way you used to. Or you're not as you know wound up when you get to work as you used to be. Or something like that. So does anybody, uh, it's a lot to throw out there. Um, does that make sense to everybody? You, you get that? Anybody have any questions? So this is your assignment for this summer. If you spent three months on one command, just on one command, I promise you all the other commands you'd be doing better too. Because what you're doing is you're fixing, you're transforming the areas in your soul that are opposed to God. You start... You start laying aside anger, you'll find blessing those who curse you a lot easier. Uh, and all of these are, are, are intertwined together. You will not, 
You will not lose time. What I want to say is you will not lose time by picking one thing and working on it three months. But do it. So you try it, you fail, you look at what went wrong, and you partner with God in transforming what's wrong in you. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, well, I'm here. I'll be here all summer. I'll be with you guys. Uh, you can harass me anytime. Um, there's nothing I would be more honored to do than if one of you came to me and said, okay, this is the thing I'm struggling with. What's going on here? Um, and I, I can't promise that I would have any answers, um, but I would journey with you with it. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out to me if there's anything. All right?